followed by Stefan Kipfer, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York, who writes on Gram whose most recent book was on Gramsci Nature, Space and Politics, and is known for his writings of Fordism in Toronto, uh, his writings on uh, suburbanism, uh, his writings on the free transit movement, and so on. All right, thanks, Greg, for organizing. Thanks, Konishka, for the remarks, which will uh, relate, to, relate to a bunch of things I'm going to say. So I'm going to make a few remarks about eco-socialism, demo democratic planning, and the urban question. And I'm, I'm organized my comments somewhat loosely around three sets of challenges that I have had the pleasure of dealing with teaching um, some of my students at York University about planning matters, grad students, undergrad students, and so on. And now many of these students, um, understandably, given that we're in a new millennium uh, in this country, uh, often do not have any practical or theoretical training in left politics uh, or even the history of, of um, radical uh, thought. Um, and this, of course, is not the fault of the students. It's the fault of the broader context which socialized them in the first place. And, and it certainly means that today, operating in a city like Toronto, um, any discussion about eco-socialism or radical planning or democratic planning requires a certain kind of effort to translate various historical experiences that a lot of people today don't have or, or don't have a memory of uh, into our current context, right? Which is often either hostile or incredulous uh, about the various strands that historically have come together in what we now call eco-socialism or democratic planning. Now, the first challenge uh, that I often face, and I recognize that actually some of my students are in, in, in the room, so you can, uh, I'm not actually talking about you, this is, this is I'm talking about the last, I'm talking about the last, the last 12 years or so of, of, uh, of my life. So, uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, one of the challenges that I, that I do face certainly is to, to uh, make it understood that planning practice, planning praxis, that is to say, collective, strategic, forward-looking action in the service of some genuinely public good, uh, that planning practice need not necessarily be the same as uh, the kinds of things that are happening right now within the parameters of uh, institutional practice, within the parameters of the extended state, government, corporations, consulting firms, and so on. Um, and it need not mean, for example, as, as Kanishka alerted us uh, uh, just a minute ago, that the planning need not be done by a few for the rest, right? as is typically the case. It also need not mean that planning is functionally segmented between what goes for urban planning over here, social planning over there, economic planning in a still different place, or cultural and envir environmental planning in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an even different institutional location. Right? Top-down planning tends to be blind to its own context, leading to certain kinds of specialization where some people plan for that part of the world and have no relationship to what's happening with other parts of the world and, other, and, and, and what planners do about those other issues. Um, now, another thing that, that exists in planning practice typically makes us uh, assume is that planning must be about various ways of rationalizing uh, or perfecting or embedding uh, the existing social and political order. Right? This is sort of the implicit assumption. The big political and economic questions are not really up for, grab, uh, for grabs when it comes to planning. They are, the, they, are the, they are they inform the basis, they, they inform the assumptions and the basis of the assumptions on which planners operate. Now, in contrast to, to existing institutional planning practice in a city like ours, um, you know, planning can also be understood as a practice of disordering things from below, of collectively, strategically organizing social mobilization of intervening collectively and strategically in dynamics of social change. 
where everybody potentially is planning uh, as everybody else, and where you know, people who may have specialized training in something uh, may act in a supporting role in those broader processes of social mobilization. Now, interestingly enough, at York uh, today, in April, it's easier certainly to make arguments like this than it was just a few months ago. Um, many people at York, too many students, uh, you know, have, have been on strike, including the majority of the planning class that I'm teaching right now. And so it's easier actually materially uh, to, to make some of these points because actually a lot of people have just done it. They have just gone through a process of collectively organizing and planning, if you like, a form of social action uh, with the goal of making some particular kinds of changes, which by all intents and purposes is an, is an aspect of, or can be understood to be an aspect of, of a planning practice. Um, so, that was challenge number one. And challenge number two, um, which is no less formidable, is really the challenge to facilitate a discussion about the fact that in various parts of the world today, not, not everywhere, but, but in many parts, um, actually existing planning practice, what goes for planning, is perhaps best described as utopist, utopian in a negative sense of a term, uh, in the sense that the goals and the solutions um, that are proposed in planning practices stand in no reasonable proportion to the problems we face and to the deeper causes these problems, the, the deeper causes for these problems. And certainly anyone who's grown up in this country over the last 20 to 30 years will have been socialized in a certain in a, into a certain culture of fall in a certain into a certain culture of, fall, of false pragmatism um, where in the interest of institutional feasibility or practicality little effort is made to ask what really are fundamental planning questions, which is, for example, how do proposed interventions stand a realistic chance of addressing the root causes of the problems they pretend to address? This is, in a sense, the fundamental planning question. Should be. To the extent that people who are in a position to plan today in various fields are committed to tackling problems of social polarization, problems of ecological degradation, problems of democratic deficits, if you like, mm -hmm. to the extent that they are committed to this, and of course not everybody is, but, but some people certainly are, they are typically discouraged at their workplaces from asking how these problems must be understood to be chronic. They're not superficial problems, they are inscribed in various aspects of the capitalist world economy and the capitalist world order, and more specifically the way in which the contradictions in this capitalist world order uh, have accentuated and deepened over the last generation, uh, and again over the last few years. So let me give you a few examples from uh, you know, what, go, what, what, goes under, what, what often goes under green urbanism, sustainable planning, if, if, if you want, to pick up uh, Kanishka's point. Now, you know, green urbanism is an academic field that really has been somewhat parasitic upon a whole, whole slew of interesting ideas and practices that have emerged, uh, often, not always, but often through environmental and social movements since the late 1960s. Um, anything from good ideas about public transportation, cycling cities, uh, mixed land uses, compact city building, Kanishka mentioned, ecological restoration, um, alternative local food initiatives, public space uh, planning, and so on and so forth. I could go on, this is a, this is a pretty big field. And there are a lot of good ideas and practices in coming through this, this, uh, this field. Uh, but there are three major problems I'd like to, I'd like to mention. Uh, the first one, particularly in, in our speaking here in, in Toronto, is uh, 
is that as limited, limited as some of those ideas are, and as pragmatic as a lot of these ideas really are, which is one of the reasons why they're so attractive to students, is that they all, they're also very limited in reach. Even in countries, in like, particularly in countries like the Canada and the United States. Some of these ideas have become mainstream, for example, in, in various planning professions. So you'll find them in, in mainstream journals, and, and you'll find them in many public events about planning. But they're not mainstream political across the country. And I think the, the forward experience we've had here in Toronto is a good is a very good indication of how how limited how, how limited the, the mainstream effect actually of some of those ideas really are in a country that is so structurally dependent on resource extraction and a very regressive form of a particularly regressive regressive form of capitalist development, if I may say so. Now that's one 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 problem. Uh, with green urban, urbanism today. The other, the other one is that in some parts of the literature on green urbanism and in some sensibilities around them, there is a tendency to unify various ideas about uh, green city building uh, into a sort of a techno-managerial utopia where the idea is that, well, you know, if only the decision makers and the political will, if, if, if only there, there are the right ideas and the right technical forms of expertise around, it's really a matter of, 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 of building a unified vision of a clean, progressive city that is ostensibly free of tensions, free of contradictions, sort of like in, in the, the, the clipping that Kanishna just showed us. Right? So kind of a cleansed, um, technocratically managed uh, um, vision of the future that is free of politics and free of, of, of social conflict. Um, the third uh, limitation, really, of, of green urbanism as it stands in, uh, today uh, on this continent is that uh, many urban, green urban reforms uh, tend to be articulated almost exclusively in physical and technological terms, assuming that sustainability, in quotation marks, environmental sustainability, can be achieved through the existing social and economic relationships that govern our world. Right? They can, that they can be achieved through um, ways of city building that are built upon commodified land, private land ownership, and real estate markets, which is a lot of planners have known for a long time that this is not possible. Actually, 100 years ago, it was very common for people to suggest that this is a utopian exercise. The assumption that existing green initiatives can be developed through economic development strategies that are all about maximizing the power of, of investors to determine the parameters of, of city building. And that it's possible to build green urbanism in an international division of labor that is still in, uh, very unequal, not the way it was unequal in the 19th century, but more unequal in some other ways than it used to be in the 19th century in the colonial world. Where the wealth of cities of Toronto that we see in front of us here is directly linked to the systematic ravaging of places in northern, northern Alberta and Central Africa, for example. Now, these three problems with green urbanism today explain why it makes sense to say what Mike Davis has said a few years ago, um, which is that urban environmentalism today has a tendency to gravitate towards producing green islands uh, that are really not as green as they pretend to be as, lo as soon as you look beyond their borders. So we've got you know, elaborate laboratories of somewhat progressive urbanism in downtown Toronto, downtown Vancouver, where I grew up in, in Zurich in Switzerland, uh, and a few other places like this around the world. But all these places are built in terms of their capacity to sustain themselves on a global division of labor that has become less and less sustainable over the very period uh, during which green urban initiatives have been developed. And uh, of course, to build green islands is not going to be a solution for uh, a sustainable planet. I'll give you perhaps one indication, just to get a bit of a sense of the proportions, uh, an ecological economist by the, name, by the name of William Rees, uh, who teaches in, uh, in BC, I think, still, yes. has, has estimated that uh, in order to actually um, start dealing 
some of the magnitude of our unsustainability in terms of energy and land consumption on this continent would mean to reduce our material energy throughput by two-thirds. Mm -hmm. This is not possible with technological and physical adjustments. Mm -hmm. It really does require um, more than serious reforms. Um, probably requ requires a revolution. Now, the challenge number three I want to just finish with, uh, and I unfortunately won't have enough time as I, I plan to, um, the challenge number three that I often face in, in the classroom is to develop an understanding that the only realistic approach to planning um, is to make what, what is seemingly impossible today real, to operate on the recognition that genuinely democratic eco-socialist planning requires not only disorganizing the current social order, but to build a new one. To build a new one. And I don't have time, we can discuss a bit later perhaps what we mean under eco-socialism and democratic planning and how the urban question fits in there. One of the things that I'm concerned about is that, that the various traditions that converge in ecological socialist thinking from, from Marx to various anti-colonial um, uh, currents to environmental justice initiatives tend to be weak on urban considerations and tend to operate on, uh, you know, on, on, on the basis of lingering anti-urban sensibilities if I may say so, and, and I think this is a bit of a problem, but, but nonetheless, eco-socialism is an important influence uh, to rethink traditions in socialism and Marxism and counter-colonialism uh, in order to produce a democratically managed, uh, non-capitalist, sustainable, ecologically sustainable future. Now, the question always arrives, well, given the gap between existing realities and the grand vision of eco-socialism, what to do? Uh, let me just finish with a couple of points. One is that from, from, pe from a pedagogical and also political pedagogical point of view, it's important to remember how many experiences we can learn from in the 19th, 20th, and early 21st century to uh, get an understanding of the limitations and contradictions and possibilities of past experiments. Um, you know, from, from the well-known cases in Europe, Vienna, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Paris, Barcelona, from the revolutionary cases in China and Cuba and the Soviet Union, the early Soviet Union, to the current cases in Bolivia, Venezuela, and Brazil, and even from some of our own histories, you know, the 70s in Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver, for example. There's all sorts of historical material that we can use not as a way to develop models, but to do what Owen Hathaway recently said, to, to, to delve into what, it, what is an index of possibility, right? to treat history as an index of possibilities for the future. Translate historical experiences, make them our own, and think what they mean for our own practice. Now, the second, the second thing, um, uh, in terms of just concluding here, is again, what to do about reforms, right? I mean, eco-socialist traditions nowadays would not dwell too much on a mechanical distinction between reform and revolution. What they would argue is that uh, we need to think about the importance of revolution but also think about reforms as possible building blocks in order to build political capacities, in order to build a sense of possibility, a sense of vision, um, in order to achieve uh, bigger things and in, in, in order to understand the limitations uh, that you quickly reach once you uh, develop social and environmental reforms at various scales. For all of this, of course, as Kanishka said, the precondition is we need to build a political movement uh, to, to get us there. Without that political capacity, um, uh, it's difficult to articulate those issues uh, in, in the broad way in which I've suggested just now.